All right, welcome back to the continuation of our BCBA practice exam series where we're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. Alex likes to make himself eggs and toast for lunch on days that he works out at the gym. He's been doing this for about six months now and has noticed some significant gains in the gym. Occasionally, Alex will add different ingredients to his eggs, but he is always disappointed with how they turn out, so he will go back to using no additional ingredients for a while. What affected Alex's use of different ingredients? So the behavior we're looking at is Alex's use of different ingredients. Let's first ask ourselves, has this behavior increased or decreased? Well, we know he occasionally goes back to it, but he always ends up using no additional ingredients for a while. So no matter what, anytime he, he tries additional ingredients, that behavior decreases due to either punishment or extinction. So now we have to ask himself, ask ourselves, what is the consequence here? Well, when Alex uses different ingredients, it doesn't taste good, right? He's disappointed with how it turns out. So how would we describe that consequence? A, socially mediated positive punishment. It's not going to be socially mediated because Alex is the only person in the scenario. It can't be socially mediated without a second party. Automatic reinforcement. Well, we know the use of different ingredients is decreasing, and it always decreases. So it's not being reinforced. C, socially mediated negative reinforcement. Again, it's not socially mediated since Alex is the only person in the scenario. Therefore, it must be D, automatic punishment. It's automatic because it is Alex is delivering the consequence to himself or the consequence is being delivered without the inclusion of a second person or party. And it's punishing because the behavior is decreasing. Wednesday night is pizza night at the Richardson's house. Mr. Richardson always buys from the same pizza shop, but has started to notice the quality is not as good on some days. Mr. Richardson also noticed that a different person was making the pizza the last two times he went in to pick up his order. So he suspects that the pizza quality is dependent on who is working that night. What goal of behavior analysis is represented here? Another goal of behavior analysis question. Let's run through them again quickly. Description, we're just stating the facts, right? Stating what has happened. If Mr. Richardson says, sometimes the pizza is worse on certain nights, that's description. Prediction is we're drawing correlations. We're making a hypothesis. So Mr. Richardson saying the pizza is worse, dependent on who is working that night, is now his correlation. He's correlating the workers with quality of pizza. It appears this is a prediction. Control has to do with an experiment. Mr. Richardson is not yet experimenting and taking data and trying to see if there's an actual relationship. All he's done is made his hypothesis. And then verification is part of baseline logic and not a goal of behavior analysis, so we can eliminate that answer. What Mr. Richardson has done here is make a prediction. Lately, Tim has started to go out less, spend less time with his family while spending more time at his house by himself. Tim goes to see a doctor who tells Tim that he might be depressed, which is causing Tim to engage in these new behaviors. Tim says that several people in his family before him have had depression as well. Depression is likely due to what? Kind of an interesting question for a behavior analyst, right? Because one, the idea that Tim's doctor is saying his behaviors are due to his depression is not necessarily something we might claim as analysts. We would be aware of the depression, but we would look at environmental, environmental variables that may be leading to the depression, which we would operationally define. So if that's the case, what is this question asking about? Well, the question is really in relation to selectionism, which has to do with why certain behaviors and characteristics persist. And with selectionism, we know it's selection by consequences. But in this case, if Tim is saying several people in his family have had depression, how would we describe that from a selectionist viewpoint? 
Depression is likely due to A, respondent conditioning. Well, we're not discussing stimulus reflex pairings here, right? That's not what the issue at hand is. So it's not going to be respondent conditioning. So what's the difference between the ontogenic and the phylogenic history of the client? Well, the ontogenic has to do with the person's individual learning history. So Tim's individual learning history. But the doctor says the depression is runs in the family. It's not just part of Tim's personal history, but his entire genetic line. So the phylogenic history is much more about evolution and hereditary characteristics and genes, right? And a long, long, long time, passing of time, where behaviors, in this case, depression, is selected. And so although this is not necessarily the most behavior analytic question, we just need to pick our best answer. And so if we're talking about a long, long history, that's going to be more related to the phylogenic history of Tim rather than the ontogenic history of Tim. Following a difficult loss, a head coach of a college football team has to take questions at a press conference. One reporter asked the coach why he thinks his team made so many mistakes in the fourth quarter that likely cost them the game. The coach tells the reporter that he has no idea why the mistakes happened, as there seemed to be no good explanation or reason for them to occur. The coach might be violating what assumption? So we have an assumption question. We want to be very precise and, and figure out exactly what information we are given. So what assumption are we violating? It's a difficult loss. The college football coach is asked questions. One reporter says, why did the mistakes happen? Why did those behaviors happen? The coach says they happen for no reason. Now, if we say behavior happens for no reason, what assumption did we violate? A, selectionism. Well, we just talked all about selectionism, and so we're not discussing learning history and phylogeny here. What the coach is violating is determinism. The universe is lawful and orderly. Behavior happens for a reason. There's going to be an explanation for those mistakes. Parsimony is going with the simplest explanation. Well, just giving no good explanation is not the simplest explanation. It's not an explanation. And then pragmatism is making a choice based on objective knowledge of the possible outcome. The coach is not making choices here. He's trying to offer an explanation that is not deterministic. Behavior happens for a reason. The coach is saying it happened for no reason. He's likely violating determinism. Which of the following is true about verbal behavior or verbal operants according to Skinner's analysis of verbal behavior? Straightforward verbal behavior question. We just have to identify what is true about Skinner's, so about what Skinner says about his verbal behavior. So A, verbal behavior is reinforced through automatic consequences. Well, we know that's not true. Verbal behavior, according to Skinner, is socially mediated, right? And it's reinforced through social interaction. B, introverbals have point-to-point -point correspondence between the speaker and the listener. Do introverbals have point-to-point -point correspondence? No. That is one of the things that separates them from echoics. C, during verbal conversation, the speaker is always the speaker and the listener is always the listener. Again, not true. The speaker starts as the speaker. When the listener responds, the listener, the listener then becomes the speaker themselves. So that leaves us with D. Verbal behavior involves the use of a learned communication system. Yes. Verbal behavior could be sign language, could be spoken. It's a learned communication system. You have successfully taught a client with autism to initiate greetings with peers during social skills using a continuous reinforcement schedule. But in unstructured settings, the client rarely initiates greetings. To promote maintenance of the greeting behavior across various settings, you decide to thin the reinforcement schedule and incorporate lag schedules of reinforcement. Which of the following best describes how these strategies facilitate maintenance? Challenging question, right? A lot of ideas. It's long. Let's attack the question. Let's think about it. We're trying to facilitate maintenance. That is our goal. So you've taught a client to initiate greetings using a continuous schedule. We obviously have to fade that schedule, right? So what we do or what we did was thin the schedule and incorporated lag schedules. And with the lag schedule, right, we are going to require different responses more and more different responses to get reinforcement. So how is that going to facilitate 
maintenance. A, thinning the schedule reduces the amount of reinforcement. That's true, which reduces the likelihood of the behavior becoming extinguished. Not necessarily. When you thin the schedule, you're essentially putting the behavior on extinction for small periods of time. And so if you thin it too quickly, you might extinguish the behavior on accident. B, using a lag schedule encourages response generalization, which helps with generalization, but not maintenance. Well, maintenance is a form of generalization. And if we're generalizing, the maintenance piece is often going to also be benefited. C, thinning the schedule and using a lag schedule reduces the behavior's reliance on external reinforcement to continue. Yes, by thinning the schedule, by using a lag schedule and requiring a more varied amount of responses, less external reinforcement is given and the behavior has to continue more and more with less reinforcement. D, the strategies combined improve the contiguity of the reinforcement, which strengthen the behavior. The strategies are not improving the closeness of the consequence. Remember, contiguity means closeness of our consequence. What's happening here is we are trying to reduce the behavior's reliance on external reinforcement because we are providing less reinforcement as the response effort is increased. A guitar player is set to compete in a local talent show for a chance to compete in a regional event if they win. The guitar player can't decide if they should play an acoustic guitar song or an electric guitar song. The guitar player spends the next week playing songs for different people and gathering feedback. What type of analysis does this compare to? Okay, let's break down our analyses. Comparative, component, parametric. Comparative, we are comparing two interventions. Component, we have two interventions, part of a package, which we are then looking at individually. Parametric, we have an intervention, and we want to know how much or how little. In this case, guitar player wants to play acoustic song or electric song. Are they part of the same set or package? No, they're two different things. And what is the guitar player doing? He's going to play once the songs for different people and gather feedback. He's comparing the songs. He's conducting a comparative analysis. If you break these questions down like this, where comparative analysis is two interventions, component is interventions are part of a package, and you can have more than two. It's just an example. Component is part of a package where comparative isn't, and the parametric is a single intervention and a dosage. In this case, the guitar player is looking at conducting comparative analysis. Early this morning, Trish was walking down the hallway when she suddenly stepped on a Lego piece and let out a painful scream. Everyone in the house woke up to see everything was all right. Now, Trish turns her phone flashlight on before walking down the hallway each morning to avoid Legos. What likely changed Trish's behavior? What is Trish doing now that she wasn't before? She's using a phone flashlight to avoid Legos. Why is Trish doing that? Well, because... She stepped on a Lego piece that hurt. So now, in order to avoid that pain, she's using a flashlight. What changed her behavior? A, respondent conditioning. Is using a flashlight a respondent behavior? No, because using a flashlight is not a reflex. This is an operant behavior. Trish's learning history has led her to using a flashlight to avoid the Legos, which equal pain. Respondent extinction and operant extinction. No behaviors are being put on extinction here. Trish is engage, engaging in avoidance with the flashlight due to operant conditioning. You're training a group of new staff members on research methodologies and applied behavior analysis. One trainee asks, why would we use a single case design instead of a group design in our research? Which of the following is the most appropriate explanation to provide? In ABA, it is much more common to use single case designs instead of group designs. Doesn't mean group designs are not effective or shouldn't be used. We just use single case designs for certain reasons. This staff member wants to know why, or the trainee wants to know why. So how, what kind of explanation could you provide them? A, single case designs allow for deeper analysis of an individual's behavior as it relates to the functional relationship between variables. That's true. And the key here is an individual's behavior. 
The advantage the single case design has is it's much more focused on the one person, whereas the group design is much more focused on the sample and the population. So a deeper analysis, analysis of an individual's behavior is true. B, a single case design is more accurate because statistical analyses are the most common analyses used to better understand results. Well, this is just false, right? We don't necessarily use statistical analyses. We use visual analysis. C, the need to establish a baseline is eliminated by single case designs, thus saving time. We definitely know that is not true, right? We are going to be establishing baselines quite often in single case design. And then D, single case designs are less resource intensive and time consuming compared to group designs. That also is not true depending on the situation. That is very situation dependent and dependent on the experiment. What would you say? You would say it is better for the individual behavior as it relates to the individual relationship between variables. The token economy system is introduced in a classroom to increase on-task behavior. The teacher is tasked with delivering the tokens. After a month, data show no significant improvement. The behavior analyst suspects issues with procedural integrity. Which of the following actions should the behavior analyst take first to address potential procedural integrity concerns? When we have procedural integrity, something is going wrong with how we are implementing the intervention. In this case, it's a token economy where the teacher is supposed to be delivering tokens. So if procedural integrity is in question, maybe the teacher is delivering the tokens wrong. What should the analyst do to address these issues? A, modify the intervention in order to make it more applicable to classroom implementation. Well, before we modify anything, we'll, we should retrain, right? Maybe the training didn't go as well as we thought. B, increase the number of backup reinforcers available to increase motivation to earn tokens. We're not worried about the system so much. It's the integrity of the system. C, discard the token economy intervention and try something different. Again, it's not so much the system. It's how it's being implemented. So what should happen is new training. D, retrain the teacher on the implementation of a token economy. Thanks for watching. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. Like, subscribe, share. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.